as I sing out your name A victory dance I will dance out in faith I will crush disappointment And break every chain Come on!
Everybody grateful for the name Jesus today? Look at the facts, you look at the story, it don't add up, and you could say, 
I'm living proof. I don't know how that happened. I wanted, I wanted to, Amber, for just a moment, this, we didn't do this last service and, and just gonna make an interruption. Is that all right? You know, God makes interruptions sometimes. And, uh, you know, week to week, we hear stories and situations, what God has done. And, and when we hear prayer requests, and people live in difficulty, going through hard times. So I just wanted to share with you, uh, can I just share with you a miracle this week? Show you a miracle? I, they don't know I'm gonna do this, but the Havards over here, can you just do me a favor? I don't know what you look like. I don't know if you're comfortable with it. Just come up here for a minute. Just come up here. Come up here. You may have to give them your mic. Thank you so much. That is a fresh baby, everybody. So this, this, why don't you tell us, Pastor Tyson's got a mic, Tommy, can you tell us a little bit of what happened here? So, uh, Monday, a few weeks ago, we all had COVID, and our baby girl had not recovered well from breathing, and it seemed like it was getting better, and then Sunday it got worse, Monday it was terrible. And so we took her to the emergency room for uh, what we thought may be pneumonia from COVID. And when they went back for a chest X-ray, they found uh, that she did have a slight touch of pneumonia in the top of her lung. It was nothing real serious. But there was a coin that was lodged at the top of her trachea. We didn't know. Had no idea. Well... When they removed the coin, the breathing was still terrible. It didn't fix anything. Hmm. But we were persistent because we know how she is. And they decided to do a CT scan. And because she swallowed a coin, it opened the door for us to find a more serious issue with her aorta. She had a double aortic arch. And it surrounded her trachea and her esophagus. Her trachea should be about the size of the end of my pinky, and it was restricted down to three millimeters. Come on. So <laughs> she's praising God. Look at she that. She knows, man. She knows. She knows the praise. Can you praise the Lord. Can you praise the Lord? Give him praise, honey. Give him praise. Come on, we'll come on. And so we went from believing it was pneumonia to now having heart surgery. Mm. This would have been done six months ago. They would have had to fully crack her chest and could do open heart surgery. But they tried a new procedure through several of her ribs, the gaps between her ribs. We were not supposed to be home best case scenario until tomorrow but thank God for his healing power his healing virtue you see I don't know how the coin got there except but by the grace and mercy of God come on man I don't know how the coin got there except by something being orchestrated by God that's right but this I know that there is a God that is able to meet our need exceedingly and abundantly more than we think or ask. So whatever you're facing today, whatever your trial is today, whatever your problem is today, I want to remind you that there is a God that is for you and not against you, that is working for your good, that is working for your good. Hear me today when I tell you that no matter what your situation is, if your trust and your faith is put in God, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I wish you'd just lift your hands today and give God praise and glory for all that He has done in your life. All that He has done in your life today. And again, come on. Come on, somebody worship the King in the house.
clap those hands. If there's anybody thankful that you're living proof, you're looking at living proof what God can still do, still do miracles, still change lives, still change people, heal people, restore people. We have a God who's not dead, but He is. Can I get a little help at 11 a.m.? I know we're off schedule, but is there anybody that would just take a praise break? Throw your hands up, throw your head back, and say thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph. Woo. The old church, they would say something like this. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. When you don't know what else to say, when you don't know where else to go, when all you hold is a miracle in your hand, sometimes you gotta say, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. One more time, let heaven hear you. Give God a praise this morning. Woo. Man. What are we supposed to do next? <laughs> Ain't God good, church? Can you let the Havards know you appreciate them, you love them? God, I pray in the name of Jesus, we agree together, no more complications, total health and healing. You will use her all the days of her life. The devil's tried to seal up the throat because she has a word on the inside. And if it gets out, all the hell will shake in Jesus' name. Use her, God, in the kingdom of God and let the rest of her life, let her stand in dominion. Let people feel the anointing on her life and let her move in what you've called her to be. And the devil couldn't stop her. And she will live and not die and declare the works of our God. In Jesus' name, everybody say Come on, give God a big praise. We're a little off schedule this morning. If this is your first time, maybe your first time in a long time, we hope it's not your last time. We consider you a VIP, and if that's you, you're very important. We would encourage you to fill out that Connect card in the seat back in front of you, drop it in the giving container on the way out. And when you do that, we donate $5 in your honor to the Mississippi Food Network. So just some good news, we've passed 15,636 meals in the state of Mississippi, so thank you so much. This last week we had our Student Youth Summit and we had an amazing time in the presence of God and we were wore out. Uh, Pastor Josiah, had it sounds like he hit puberty this week. The <laughs> <laughs> the kids just had an amazing time. And we got to give a shout out to Pastor Josiah, all the team, and everybody made it possible to do that. Just incredible job. Incredible job. So many students just surrendering their lives to Jesus. And you know, those moments matter. It makes a difference forever. And uh, we're really uh, thankful for a church. I want to say thank you to you for making the possibility and believing in the next generation. Believing in the next generation. One more thing before we get into the message today, our first Wednesday service is this coming Wednesday. A friend of mine I've known for a while named Pastor Adam Drinkard is going to be with us sharing the Word of God and breaking the bread of life. And I want to encourage you to get in the room and get ready for a word and spend some time with some folks who's going to be here this coming Wednesday. So get ready, get in the room, and prepare yourself to, to be touched by God. Can I get a big amen? amen? Well, on your way to your seat, just fist bump some people, smile at somebody, shake hands, say, it's good to see you today. Good to see you today.
Man in the Mirror was a song released by uh, Pastor Michael Jackson, February 6th, 1988, as the fourth single from Jackson's seventh solo album, Bad, in 1987. Three years before I was born. Man in the Mirror topped the Billboard Hot uh, charts 100 for two weeks straight, becoming Jackson's 10th number one single on the chart. The words are, I'm uh, starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways and no message could have been any clearer. If you wanna make the world a better place, if you wanna make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make a change. The song is expressing that before we try to fix the world around us, we need to address some things within us. Before we try to fix things externally, we need to look hard internally and make the adjustments that are needed to make the world a better place. We need to look at ourselves and make, make the change. Now, a mirror reveals ourselves accurately. Everybody say accurately. Now, have you ever seen a picture of you or seen a video of you, or you know, you've had your phone and accidentally turned the camera around and been completely startled at what you saw? You ever seen a picture of yourself? You're like, there's just no way I look like that. I'm asking you today to be objective, to take a moment and to look into the mirror of your soul and to look deep into who you really are. My first question for you today is this, what do you see when you look in the mirror? Now, a lot of people when they look in the mirror see success, see their accomplishments, see the neighborhoods they live in, see their net worth, see what they've built, some people see the cars they drive. Some people, it, some people do that. Well, I'm asking you to go a little further than that. I'm asking you to look a little deeper. And now we're looking a little deeper. Maybe we see some insecurities and brokenness, some shame, maybe some hurt and trauma. And I'm asking you to go a little further. I'm asking you to look deep into that mirror and to be honest with yourself. Nobody else with you directly, and I want you to ask God, what do you see in there? Like, help me, God, to see who I really am. I heard of a girl who was in a car accident because she kept using the rear view mirror to look at herself while she drove. And that sounds insane, doesn't it? But really, the girl was admiring herself and ended up causing an accident in her, and causing damage to her car and could have killed her. Many of us do the same. When I'm asking you to look in the mirror of life, many of us are so busy admiring ourselves, admiring our, our, our beauty or our accomplishments or our good works or our manners or our morals, and we think we're something, don't we? We really do. We can't. We, we work hard, we do everything we can to have a good name and a good reputation, and we treat our kids good, we go to work, we do all we know to do, but if we were really honest, many of us live in an, an alternate reality of ourselves, and what I'm asking you today is to look deep. And if all of humanity was to just take a moment and look into this mirror and could really see the reality, the reality of our condition, I believe that we would come up with one thing that is for everybody, for all mankind, every background, every income, every color, every creed, every nation, and that is this, we are guilty. When we really look into the mirror, we will find that we are guilty. Romans chapter three, verse 23 says, for everyone, everyone, everywhere has sinned. Everyone is in a default position, 
starting out in life as a sinner. Scripture goes on to say that we all, everybody, falls short of God's glorious standard. One place in the Bible says that we're born in sin and shapen in iniquity, meaning that when we come to earth, shapen in the wound, when we are born, the reality of it is, if we could be honest, though we are cute little babies, we are born little baby sinners. Some of you are like, you know my kid, don't you? I know my kids, I do that. The reality of it is that we are not mostly good and sometimes bad. And we are not mostly bad and sometimes good. We are all, by default, at the bottom of the cross, guilty. And, and to prove it to you, to prove it to you, allow me to take you on a journey just to help you assess this. Because maybe some of you are wrestling right now, thinking, well, actually, Pastor Ethan, I'm like, I pay my taxes, I'm a good person. You know, let, let's go a little deeper. Can we go a little deeper? In the book of Exodus, God spoke to Moses and gave him the law, gave him the Ten Commandments. Now, how many of you have gone to church for a while? You've heard the Ten Commandments taught. You understand that it is something that, that is a part of the Christian faith. Only, let me just go through them for a minute, okay? Let the Ten Commandments be a mirror for a moment for all of us. Here's the first commandment. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Okay, well, you're at church today, so you're probably doing pretty good, Right? It's not football season yet, so hang on, everybody. Here's, here's number two. You shall not make idols. Shall not make idols. Now, um, in, in one translation, it is to make graven images, meaning that you're shaping a God that you believe is God in the way that you like that God to be. Now, many of us would think, well, I don't got little tiki things at my house and little statues at my house. We don't pay our tithes to a little building or anything. No, 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 we, we, we don't do this. Well, really what this is is that you're shaping God in your image. You've built a theology of God based on your experiences and your preferences rather than what the Word of God says about God. So, so I'm sure some of us are guilty of that one. Let's, let's move on to see how we're doing. Uh, you should not take the name of the Lord in vain. That is not necessarily referring to um, cursing, though that implies. It also goes with living a life using the name of God, but living how you want. Let me quote the New Testament when it says that we have a form of godliness, but we deny the power thereof. In other words, you go to church, but you live like hell. Can I talk to anybody in the room today? That, that the reality of it is you're living your life using his name in vain. You got the Christian bumper sticker, got the verse on your Instagram feed or whatever, but at the end of the day, you're not really following God. You're using his name in vain. Mm. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. A day of rest. This is a command. He's, God's telling us that we need to be people that takes a day a week and, and, and worships God and does nothing but serve and love God and, and rests. That's a tough one. Many of us work constantly, distracted constantly. Here's another one. Honor your father and your mother. Honor your father and your mother. In one part of the Bible, it refers back to this and says, honor the, your father and your mother for this is right. For this is right. It doesn't say honor your mother and your father, for they are right. Is anybody uncomfortable yet? I mean, I'm feeling guilty already. That we honor them because of the position God gave them in our lives. So we honor the president, we honor congressmen, we honor senators, we honor authority, we honor people in those positions. Th though their performance may, may not be perfect, we are still required by the word of God to honor the position, though they may lack in performance. So you may not love your mom and dad, but you better honor them. That may not have been great. But dad may not even been there, but in, in the spirit of the word of God, you have to have a spirit of honor. It's tough, it's tough, ain't it? That's a tough one. Let's move on. Let's see what else we got. You should not commit murder. Woo, some of you feeling good now. Finally, one you haven't done today. But I hate to, I hate to tell you, Jesus said anybody who hates a man in his heart says he's a murderer. 
Jesus said, if you call a man and like an idiot, you was like you've murdered him. Some of you are like, I murdered like my husband like three times this morning. <laughs> I've definitely murdered people in the Kroger parking lot, I can tell you that. Let's go on. Hey, you still good? You still with me? Here's another one. You, you should not commit adultery. Now, many of us have heard this, and we know this, but many of us can be thinking, well, I ain't done that. But the scripture says, Jesus quotes this and says, you've heard it said like this, but in addition to that, you need to understand that adultery is not just what you do, it's what you think and what you think about. It's what you look at, what you're, what you're admiring. If you're looking twice, if you're undressing them, if you're thinking that way, if you're looking at it, if you're visiting that site, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but you're committing adultery. Though you didn't get the hotel room, you committed adultery. Hmm. Here's another one, you shall not steal. Steal company time, steal on taxes, some of you are thinking, well, Pastor Ethan, here's the reality. The government's been stealing from us forever. You're right. They're all crooks. I don't got anything to say there. I mean, it's <laughs> straight up. Somebody say amen. We honor the position, but they crooked. Let's move on. <laughs> you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not bear false witness. This is lying. This is manipulating relationships to slight somebody, to maneuver your agenda. It's not these outright allegations. It, it, it almost feels like that when you read it. Really, it's just relational, interpersonal complications where we begin to use white lies to manipulate other folks. That's also a part of this. Hmm. Here's another one, here's the last one, you shall not covet, okay? Wanting what other people have. Social media makes billions of dollars on that. So, so how are you feeling after those 10? After you looked in the mirror for just a moment, we got the reality of what they were, you look in that mirror, <laughs> what does it feel like? James chapter two says this, many of us could be thinking, well, here's the deal, I have a, I'm only four out of 10, Pastor Ethan, that's not bad, right? <laughs> four out of 10 ain't bad? Well, let me show you this, James chapter two says this, for the person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all the laws of God. So even if you kept eight out of that list and you broke number nine, the scripture says it's like you broke them all. Wait a minute. You're telling me that I have been working really hard to keep all these commandments. And if I slip on one, if I just did one, if I took the stapler from the office, <laughs> you telling me I'm like a killer? You're as guilty as a person who has broken every law. Now, are you beginning to feel the weight of your imperfections? Are you beginning to feel the weight of your sins and your lies and our issues? Are, are you feeling this? Are you beginning to feel the struggle? Are you looking in the mirror and reminding yourself of your brokenness? Are you seeing that you are not as clean and as good and as important as you think you are? Are you seeing it now that you're guilty? as if you've broken every law, if you've broken one. Let me freak you out. Everybody in this room has broken half of them this morning. Look in that and see who you really are, guilty. And I wanna just pause right here and just as a, just let me, allow me to like parenthetically insert this for you real quick, it is, it is, it is easier to forgive people who hurt you when you remember that you're guilty too.
when you are dealing with offense and anger and bitterness, there will be times you want to point the finger, but the reality of it is, if you could just remember that right there, how could you hold something over them that God doesn't hold over you? Just remember you're guilty. Just remember that you need God and you're nothing without him. And you may have to remind yourself like, man, I don't have it all together. Who is man that you are mindful of him? Every time I get up to preach, I, every week I just take a moment. And I remind myself that God, you called me. This is your idea. I'm imperfect. I don't have it all together. God, I know that without you, I can't do this. You know, churches will have a lot more unity. You know, you go to churches, and there's great churches all over the world, and they say there's somewhere around 419 to 500,000 churches in the United States, and many people will attend these churches, and you go in, and they've gotten stiff and religious and legalistic, and what happens is over time, these, these well-meaning people gave their lives to Christ, found grace, and got real tough, got real stiff, and now they got a church full of a bunch of people that are proud of their spirituality and haven't looked in the mirror in a while and reminded themselves, you know what, I've broken God's law too. I'm imperfect too. I need Jesus too. I don't got my life together too. And we have to remind ourselves here at Vibrant Church that we're all level at the foot of the cross. That when somebody comes in not looking like they're church folk, we are glad you're here because we all are looking in the mirror and we all need grace. Now you may be thinking, well, you're kind of confusing me with the law and what are we doing? I thought we were under grace. Romans chapter three says this, obviously the law applies to those whom it was given. For its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show the entire world is, is that it is guilty before God. The purpose of the 10 commandments, the law, is to first reveal to people they have no excuse before God. And it shows who's guilty. The law wasn't given to make us right with God. It was given to show us how far away from him we are. You don't keep the Ten Commandments to be right with God. You will keep the Ten Commandments because you're right with God. Am I helping anybody? You will never know how good God is. The point of the law is to remind you how bad sin is and to know how good God is. You will never know how good God is until you get the understanding how bad sin is. Let, let me illustrate. Um, if you were to walk out of church today and you see a judge in his robe and while you're um, walking out, he looks at you and says, hey, by the way, just wanna let you know, um, I talked to my son and we paid your $25,000 uh, fee that you owe um, the, the city. You would be embarrassed because you don't know what he's talking about. You'd be like, wait a minute, I didn't do anything. I don't know what you're talking about. Your kids are standing there like, daddy, are you going to jail? Like, wait a minute. I, got, I don't even know what you're talking about. I didn't do anything. Now, if you step out, and the same judge is there. And the judge says, I wanna let you know something that a couple weeks ago we clocked you uh, going 60 miles an hour in a zone that was seasonally blocked off for a blind children's, I'm not making fun, you bad, you're bad people right now, convention. And we had signs lined up saying slow down, slow down, and you ignored all 10 of those signs. And you drove as fast as you could, and we got you red-handed. We got your license plate pictured, and now the fee is $25,000, and if you don't pay it, you're going to jail. All of a sudden, you're immediately brought face-to-face -face with your sin. Then the judge looks at you and says, hey, got an idea. Just want to let you know. Talk to my son. He paid the fee for you, $25,000. You're free. Don't worry about it. It's done you now immediately come to the realization how good the gospel really is. The problem is we are sharing the gospel in a way 
and telling people that if you give your life to Christ, everything will be perfect, everything will be good. If you just give your life to Jesus, he'll make you happy. I believe God makes us happy. I believe God gives us joy. But we have to understand when we're saved, what are we saved from? People have to know that if you are saved, you're saved from a life of complete banishment into outer darkness away from God. That's the gospel, that you and I are guilty, and we are guilty before a holy, just God, and we have, we are guilty with high treason before a holy, perfect, just God. And now, we have a problem. The law has revealed to us. The judge has revealed to us our sin and our brokenness. God uses the law to help us recognize, in essence, our spiritual poverty. Are you seeing it? Are you feeling the weight? of knowing that you're broken and you're lost and you're guilty. I, uh, one thing I've learned, I've learned a few things since I've moved to Mississippi. You guys have been teaching me some things that they don't teach you up home. One of which is you can speed in Columbus, Mississippi because everybody else speeds in Columbus, Mississippi. In fact, you can, you can speed on Highway 50 going to West Point. You shouldn't, but we do because everybody else speeds. You guys are making me feel guilty up here. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Here's another thing. Here's another thing I learned in Mississippi is that yellow means fast. <laughs> Am I right about it? I was shocked the first few weeks I was here and then the yellow light would hit yellow. I'm telling you, I've never seen a car slow down one time. It is gunning right through that light. Another interesting thing I saw yesterday, I see this all the time, I don't get it, I'm gonna start doing it to fit in, I don't know what to do. But when cars are turning left in front of a car in front of you, the car who's not turning left in front of you will hit their blinker on the left to let you know, hey, two cars ahead to turn to left. Do you, any of you do that? Can someone write me like a letter, tell me, explain to me why? And are you letting me know two cars ahead is turning left with your blinker? When they turn left, you go straight, turn your blinker off. What is happening? <laughs> Am I right? Come on, you guys gotta know that's confusing. I mean, that's, I know it's trying to be helpful, but it doesn't, I feel like I'm scared. I'm like, I don't know, I got my hazards on and I'm crying, I don't know why. Here's another thing I learned about Mississippi. Is there is one particular city you cannot speed through, and it is Gordo, Alabama. <laughs> Come on, anybody ever got a ticket in Gordo, Alabama? Look at you coming to life right now. You know the devil thought he had you in Gordo, Alabama. Reform, Alabama, that's another one. And here's the thing, when you're driving down the highway and you get in the flow of traffic, you know what I'm talking about? Everybody's moving at a pretty elevated pace and everybody's driving fast. And let's say, you know, speed limit's 70, everybody's sitting around 85. You're all breaking the law, okay? <laughs> Somewhere in 85, I don't know, something like that. And, and, and just a reminder, everybody's guilty. Everybody's guilty. The justification we feel is that other people are doing it as well. So we feel secure. Now you know what I'm about to tell you that happens every time. You're going over a hill, you're on Highway 82 heading into Alabama. And all of a sudden there's a cop car sitting right there. And everybody flies past the cop car and everybody's brake lights. Dun, 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 dun. And, and, and then <laughs> you do what all of us do Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you right now. I command every spirit but the Holy Spirit to get off this cop. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we all do it. But doesn't it, do you, are you like me? Every time you drive past a cop, don't it look like their wheels move? 
I promise, I look in the rearview mirror, it looks like it goes, mm. oh. But when a cop comes out, everybody thinks it's them getting pulled over, except for the one that probably ain't speeding. But every person who is guilty sees those blue lights and they know, hmm, I'm guilty. Reveals to me my guilt. I know I'm guilty. You know, when Jesus, the night he was taking the, the Last Supper with his boys, the last night he was eating the Last Supper with his boys, you know the scripture tells us that he looks and says, one of you is gonna betray me. Do you know that? And every one of them said, is it me? Not one of them were sure enough in their pureness. Everybody saw the blue lights and knew they have sped. That's the gospel, hear me. When the law puts the blue lights behind us and reveals to us, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not commit adultery, immediately we look at that odometer of our conscience and we know, I'm guilty. I'm guilty, it reveals to us who we are. We immediately look into that mirror and see the guilt. Now hear me today, I did not give you the 10 commandments to see if you passed the test. I gave you the 10 commandments to remind you that we all failed it. That it is pertinent for the gospel, for people to understand that you're guilty. You're guilty. I'm reminded of the story of D.L. Moody, who I've, sh I've shared a portion of this before, but I love this story. Allow me to read a portion of it. He was visiting some inmates one day, and he wrote this. I had got almost through the prison when I came to a cell and found a man with his elbows in his knees and his head in his hands. Two little streams of tears running down his cheeks. And I said, what's the trouble? He looked up. The picture of remorse and despair, and the man quoted, D.L. Mo Moody quotes the man saying, oh, my sins are more than I can bear. D.L. Moody looks back at him and says, thank God for that. The man replied, what do you mean? It was at that moment that D.L. Moody began to share with him the power of the gospel told him about Christ, how he came to seek and to save that which was lost and to open prison doors and to set captives free. Dio Moody wrote that it was like a cup of refreshment to find a man who believed he was lost. Upon leaving the cell, Dio Moody put his hand through a small window and shook the man's hand. And Dio Moody said this, I put my hand through the window and as I shook hands with him, a tear fell on my hand that burned down into my soul. It was a tear of true repentance. He believed he was lost. D.O. Moody says he went back to the hotel. He came back the next day, and the countenance of the man was completely different. He said it was almost as a light had shined through the man's face. The man had given his life to Christ. And Dio Moody wrote this, can you tell me why the Son of God came down to that prison that night? And passing cell after cell, went to that one specific cell to set that captive free. Dio Moody wrote, it was because the man believed he was lost. It is so vital that every one of us, whether you've been saved for 50 years or you're not saved at all, that you look in this and you never forget, I'm lost. I'm guilty. I've broken every law. I'm so unworthy, you see. Timothy Keller, one of my favorite writers of all time, said this, the irony of the gospel is that the only way to be worthy of it is to admit you're completely unworthy of it. Romans chapter five. 
in closing, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God shows his love for us that while we were still guilty, Christ died for us. Let, let me change it just a little bit to help you understand. Uh, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still guilty, Christ died as us. On the cross, all the consequences and penalty for your sin was placed on his son, Jesus. You and I should be punished for what we find in the mirror. Everything we've done wrong, everything you've said, everything, all the faults and, and failures and default position, born in shaping and sin and iniquity. You and I deserve eternal punishment in hell. In hell. Where Jesus only gives a few details. He says, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping because of the regret of why didn't I just say yes? The weeping where they wish their eyes was filled with tears so they could get a drop on their tongue. The weeping of regret and sorrow. Some theologians believe, according to Scripture, that the people in outer darkness, what the Scripture teaches as hell, can look up to heaven and see people in heaven. But people in heaven cannot look down and see people in hell. Oh, God. Weeping. And the second one, gnashing of teeth. Representing the fury of man. Why did you put me in this place? For millions of years, men through their teeth crying out, I hate you, God. Why did you put me here? Let me tell you something. God has never put a person in hell. People send themselves to hell because they did not accept Jesus Christ. Hear me. Not one person has ever gone to hell that didn't deserve it. And not one person has ever gone to heaven that deserved heaven. Think of that. Everybody deserves eternal punishment. But God, while we were yet guilty, stepped into the story and said, I'm not going to let them die for their sin in their sin. What I'll do is I will come to earth and I will absorb on myself the punishment due to them. And when I take their place in sin, they take my place in right standing with God. Hear this. God treated Jesus on the cross as if he lived your life. So he could treat you as if you lived his. That's the gospel. John chapter 3, verse 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. If you want to make the world a better place. Take a look at yourself. With raw, objective scrutiny. Isn't it easier to find the sins of other people than it is to find our own? So many times we turn the mirror on others and say, you look. Look what you've done. Look, you could have been a better mom. You could have this, you could have that. What if today the Holy Spirit's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We, we, we gotta talk about you. 
Many could be saying that economics and education and opportunities will make the world a better place, and those are all right in their sense, but what if we took time and stared in the mirror today at the man and woman and realized our desperate need for Jesus? Every day, every day, because listen, you never stop breaking the law. We're not perfect. We constantly fall short, and we need the finished work of Jesus Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, I was listening to a theologian one time, and this is a little deep, but I love it. This theologian said he was in a class one time, and somebody said, you know, I believe there are multiple ways to God, and, and do you believe in multiple ways to God? And, and the, the professor looked back at the young lady and said, I have a better question. Why is there even one way to God? You know, he initiated all of it. You were not lovable. You were not attractive. You are not that important. You are not that significant. You are dust, the Bible says. And God, before the foundations of the earth, decided that before they even make their first mistake, because of that sin nature, I'm going to send my son, already made up in his mind. Why would you even make one way? Why would you make one? The only way I can come up with it is what we just read. For God so loved, it makes no other sense. Nothing else motivates God like his love to give his son. For God so loved you by name. Can't let them live in heaven without me. Excuse me. I can't let them live in earth without me and me live in heaven without them. Hear me today. If you hear anything I'm going to say, this is the final thought of the day. I'm going to close my iPad and I'm going to go eat some Cracker Barrels today. It's going to be good. It's the country, what is it? Chicken fried chicken. Glory to God. Mm. Still thinking about it. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Good people, moral people, good people. Great dads, great moms, great individuals. I hate to burst your bubble. But I sometimes fear, you know, I, I'm not from the Bible Belt. Um, I love it here. It's, it's way too hot. It's seriously too hot. But we're not careful, you know. We just, church is something we do and we think we're good people. I'm doing my best, I'm keeping the commands. And I just want to remind you that if you're anything for me today, you need to walk out of this building knowing if there's one sentence you write down in your Bible if you have to, if there's one sentence you need to write down in your phone and look at every day, good people, good people are in outer darkness right now. I pat me, it's so true. I don't know how, I wish it wasn't true, but it is a fact that good people are not in heaven. Forgiven and saved people. Someone's calling in the cows or something back there. <laughs> Forgiven people, when you stand before God, the question will be, my dad always says this, what did you do with this man named Jesus? Bible says it is the power of God unto salvation, the gospel. With eyes closed all over the room, no one looking around, you need to, needed to be reminded today to look in the mirror. You needed to be reminded today that you're imperfect, you're, you have imperfections. You, you need to be reminded today of that you're lawless, 
We need to be reminded today that humanity is a broken system and we cannot fix ourselves even though we think we can every four years, though we think we can with better technology, though we think we can with medicinal breakthroughs and all those things are good, but we still can't save ourselves. We're just increasing our capabilities to do evil. We're not getting better. We're not progressing. We're lost. And our default setting before God I've come to tell you today, we need the gospel of Jesus Christ in our churches, in the world, in your family, in your mind. You need to be reminded that you are nothing without the blood of Jesus. And if you're in the room today and you need to give your life to Jesus for the first time, put your trust in the finished work of Christ because hear me, if he doesn't pay for your sin, you will pay for it. The scripture teaches it's the wrath of God to come. This may be a little heavy. Michael Jackson didn't think this was going to happen. But hear me today. God has made a way. And it is simple. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. If you're in the room and that's you, I want you to just raise your hand right where you are. I, I want to give my life to Christ or I need to rededicate my life to Christ. Last service, several hands were up. Thank you for those hands. It's saying, pray for me. I want that in my life. Will everyone repeat this prayer today? Say, dear Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean with your blood. Forgive me of my transgression. I've broken your law. I'm reminded today that I fall short. And I need you, Jesus, to make me right with you. Father, I believe that I will spend eternity with you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, 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 amen. Will you stand with me? I want to just say this before we go. Um, I said this to the last service, I want to say it to you as well, is just look at me real quick. We're going to let you go. Um, a lot of people believe in theory what I just preached. A lot of people understand it. A lot of people get it. People have heard it. Um, but a lot of people don't experience it because it's unfortunate that so many of us allow how we feel to determine if we're a Christian. And when we come to Christ, we have to remember that we walk by faith and not by sight. So when you feel like you're not a Christian, you have to understand that you are in the family of God based on nothing but faith. So nothing you did made you a Christian. You make me, you hear me? Other than everything you believe. You believe the right thing. You believe that Jesus died. So you're a, in the family of God. So let me ask you this question. When's the last time you got up, and the Hankins family here, when's the last time you got up in the morning and like, man, I just don't feel like a Hankins? Well, you're married in. That's not what I'm talking about. Let's go to you. <laughs> she screwed that at an illustration up. Uh, Lolly, when's the last time you woke up and be like, man, I just feel like such a fake Lolly today? Get out. I'm done with these church people messing my illustrations up. My point is this. You don't get to feel. Your feelings will lie to you. Yeah, there's joy and there's moments of you just feel peace. and That's so true. But the devil will hit you with your feelings a lot and try to convince you, well, well, you believe, you don't feel no different. You're a dog and you're this and you're a sinner and you're, hear me today. It's an, if I give my life to Christ and I put my faith in the finished work of Jesus, hear me, it is an established fact I'm in the family of God. I don't feel my way in and out of it. I'm not up and down, in and out. I am saved by grace through faith. 
And if I just keep walking by faith and keep following Jesus and picking up my cross and following him and loving him and serving him, there will be a day you stand before God and he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. He doesn't say, well felt. Well felt, you felt this all the way to here. I don't feel like, have you ever, listen, when you get married, I've never, I've done a bunch of weddings. When you stand in front of somebody and you say, would you like to take this woman? And you do this whole thing and nobody ever says, when I feel like it, you would be like, sit your ugly self down, son. This ain't gonna work. You say, I do. And how many of you are married and you get up in the morning and sometimes you feel like, I don't. But covenant is God saying, I do. Because your, hear me, your salvation is not often as based on you holding on to him as it is as him holding on to you. Aren't you thankful that God has you in his hand and loves you and cares for you and loves you? We're saved by grace through faith. If there's anything to praise God for, if there's anything to put my hands together for, if there's anything to praise God about, it's because I'm saved by what He did and He didn't throw me away from what I did. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray that their emotions will not dictate their relationship with you. I pray you stabilize the men and women of God. I pray you give them faith today, peace today. Let them just walk in faith and not be determined by what they feel, but they will know that I'm saved by grace through faith in Jesus' name. And there is therefore now no condemnation. Shame off of you today. In Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody said, amen. Come on, give God a big praise in this house.